Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with another of our top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today, we'll examine 10 clusters of truth about your identity in Christ. You know the old song, I'm only a sinner saved by grace? It's a nice sentiment, but far from the truth. That's who I was, but who am I in Christ? The secret of breaking from the ho-hum, mediocre Christianity to the abundant life that Christ has given us and who we're meant to be. Christians make up names for themselves, but God gives us much better ones. Here they are. Number one, names about our relationship with God. Now let me just say, by way of introduction, that Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, lets us know what he thinks of names that we might call denominational. He says, I say this, that each of you says, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? In other words, why invent names when God has given us so many wonderful? The names that God gives us unify God's people. The names that we make up divide God's people. So let's be done with those divisive names and let's embrace the names the Lord gives us they describe exactly what he thinks of us. They're his terms of endearment for us. And so regarding names about our relationship with God, we're called children, that's the Greek word technon, and we're called sons, that's the word huios. And the idea, the difference between them is that a child is a born one of God, one who shares the life of God, whereas son is something different. Some people object to that and say we should say sons and daughters, but this is actually a technical term. I tell people I won't object to being part of the bride if sisters don't object to being sons. But the idea is not simply being born into the family, but entering in to the rights and privileges of sonship. So if you see a sign that says it's a boy, that's referring to a baby being born. But if you see a sign on a business that says Smith and Son, you know that that's not a baby. He's grown up and now takes responsibility in the family business. So we are both born as children and as sons, but we are not yet placed as sons in the family business. We're still training for reigning. But once we get our glorified body, Paul tells the Romans, then we will be able to be placed in these positions of honor and responsibility. So we're children of God, sons of God, and then we're called God's husbandry. The Lord Jesus said, my father is the husbandman or the, the farmer. And God looks upon us as an investment he is making in enriching our lives, in bringing fruit to us. So he prunes us, he cares for us, and we should happily submit to his work. So these three link us in our relationship with God. And then from there, we see number two, names about our relationship with Christ. Right, we're called disciples, that is learners, followers of Christ. We're called his own, a beautiful title in which he puts his arms around us, so to speak, and gives us a hug. And then we're his virgin bride. These three emphasize learning as disciples, loving as his own, and looking for him as his virgin bride, waiting for the bridegroom to come and receive us home. And then we could guess number three. These are names about our relationship with the Spirit. You're right, we're called saints. The term saint is the same word really as holy, and that's his first name, the Holy Spirit. And so we too are sanctified. And the idea is we're set apart for his use, set apart for his glory set apart from the world and for the service and worship of God. And then, of course, we're referred to as a holy temple. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is working to put together this temple. He's like the mortar that holds together the living stones that is becoming a habitation of God, quote, 
through the Spirit. So we're a holy temple, and then we're called worshipers. And worship is the highest privilege of the people of God. It's occupation with, enjoyment of, and adoration towards God himself. The Holy Spirit loves to take of the things of Christ and show them to us. Christ came to show us the Father, and so we see this chain reaction where the Spirit of God reveals to us the Word of God, the Word of God reveals the Son of God, the Son of God reveals the character of God, and through this we develop in our appreciation of God and become true worshipers, worshipers in spirit and in truth. Next we have names about our relationship with other saints. Yes, and here we have brothers and sisters. We belong to the same family. We're also called examples to one another and imitators of the Lord. And we're also called members of the body. So here we see our intimacy as brothers and sisters. And the scripture makes it clear, don't cross the line. You know, when we're dealing with spiritual things, we're dealing with the most intimate part of someone. And we need to be careful that we don't take undue advantage of this family relationship for things that are not wholesome. But we should treat our brothers and sisters the way we would treat our own brothers and sisters in our human families. And then examples and imitators, this emphasizes not so much our intimacy, but our influence. We influence one another and hopefully for the good. And then members of the body emphasizes our interdependence. We're all together in this bundle of life, helping one another as each member in the body functions, the whole body grows up. Number five, names about our relationship to the world. Here we're called Christians. Now, of course, that does link us with Christ, but it was a name given by the world to Christians. It was a pejorative, it was a put down, and it actually is the diminutive. It means little Christs, which is really a backhanded compliment. It would be nice if people saw me on the street and said, oh, there's one of those little Christs. But that's what they were called, but it links them out as being different from everyone else around because their loyalty is not with this world it's not with a certain political party or a certain philosophy in the world. Our link is with Christ. We live for him to serve him. And then, secondly, we're called strangers and pilgrims. Now, stranger means you don't belong where you are. And pilgrim means you do belong where you're going. So the three ideas, Christians, we belong to Christ, strangers, we don't belong here, and pilgrims, we do belong there. We're headed home. Number six, names about our responsibilities. Paul says, I'm a debtor. We are debtors. We have received such blessings, such privilege, that we owe it to share. The word ought is the word that actually means owe it. It's a contraction of the old English word. And when we ought to do these things, we owe it to people around us because we have so much blessing. It's like the four beggars who discovered that the Syrian army had fled and the people of Samaria were starving. And as they're sitting enjoying all this bounty, they said, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. We better get in and tell these people or something bad's going to happen to us. So we should have this sense of ought. God has been so good to us, we need to share it. And so we are debtors. Secondly, we're soldiers. This is not a picnic. It's not a party. We're in a battle. To avoid the battle, you, you might as well hide up the muzzle of a gun. Like, we are the battlefield. We're not going to get away from this. Thankfully, God has equipped us with a panoply, the word that means a complete set of armor. Interestingly, the only other time that word is used in the New Testament, we read that a stronger than the strong man, Satan, has taken away all his armor. That's the same word panoply. So Christ has stripped the devil of his armor and he has given us a complete set of armor. So we ought to be more than conquerors through him who loves us. And then thirdly, stewards. So debtors 
regarding the gospel, soldiers regarding the spiritual battle, and stewards regarding the proper use of our possessions, our time, our talents, our things for the glory of God. So these speak about our responsibilities. Number seven, names about our positions of honor. Wow, this will straighten your back when you're feeling a bit saggy. We are ambassadors. We represent a foreign country. We are behind enemy lines. We're in a foreign country and we have been sent on a mission. Now an ambassador doesn't get involved in local politics. He doesn't give his own opinion. When he speaks, he is speaking as if he were the, the head of the country he represents. What is our mission? As ambassadors, we are pleading on behalf of God himself that people will be reconciled to God. So that's our ambassadorship. We are representing God's offer to the human race. That if they will accept the offer we make, God will accept them into heaven forever. And then secondly, we're citizens. Of course, Paul, he was born in a city far from Rome, but he was a Roman citizen. Because when the Roman Caesars would come to a foreign city with their army, they would give them two options. And option number one was bow the knee and become a Roman citizen. Or two, fight us and we'll clean your clock. So obviously, the city where Paul grew up had made this arrangement. And so Paul was a Roman citizen in an outpost of Rome. And so this is the idea that he uses to describe the idea that even though we're not in heaven, our citizenship is in heaven. We were born from above. And the Lord Jesus said, Father, I have sent them into the world just as you sent me into the world. You may think you started here, you were born here, but God says, no, when you came into this world, you were born dead, you were stillborn. Your birth began in heaven. You were born from above, and I've sent you into the world, and you are a citizen of another country. Your loyalty, your love is in heaven. That's why the scripture says, the Jerusalem which is from above is the mother of us all. The idea being that your mother is the source of your life, the source of your love, the source of your loyalty. That's where it all is up in heaven. And then thirdly, we're kings and priests to God. This idea that we represent Christ's mission as ambassadors, we represent Christ's home in heaven as citizens, and we represent Christ's offices. He has invited us to join him to sit on his throne and be king priests. Now in the Old Testament, the kings and priests were separate. The kings came from Judah, the priests came from Levi. Separation of church and state was God's idea. But in Christ, he has unified them. Under a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, we have a priest sitting on a throne. And Jesus has invited us to share with him these two offices of representing God to people and representing people to God as kings and priests to our God. Number eight, names about our service for the Lord. So we're called laborers, we're called ministers, and we're called partakers or fellows. So we have this idea of fellow soldier, fellow worker, fellow labor, and so on. The idea of fellows. So here, laborer focuses on the task. There's a work to be done. Minister focuses on the status. People have taken the word minister and elevated it, but it's really a word for a lowly servant. And so our status is not to elevate ourselves, but to humble ourselves under the hand of God and follow the example of Christ who got down and washed his disciples' feet. We share the status of the lowly Son of God in Galilee. And then thirdly, partakers or, or fellowship, fellow heirs, fellow soldiers, fellow workers. It's this idea of cooperation. We're co-workers together. So the task, uh, the status, and our co-workers together represented by these three names given to the servants of the Lord. 
Number nine, names that highlight our outstanding characteristics. The most common one is believers. We believe. We believe in the Lord. It's linked with the idea of being faithful. We take what he says seriously and we seek to live it. And then secondly, we're called the pillar and bulwark of the truth. And here the emphasis is on being truthful. Like the beautiful capital of a pillar holding it up and saying we're not ashamed of the truth. We're not apologetic for it. We think it's beautiful. We're characterized as being faithful and as being truthful. And then thirdly, we're called salt and light. And here the idea is being purposeful. We're in the world for a purpose, to be salt and to be light, to influence around us those who still don't know the Savior, those who need to have the bitterness of this world neutralized by the sweetness of God's people and those who need to see the light in the darkness. So these are three characteristics of the people of God being faithful, being truthful, and being purposeful. Well, if these first nine aren't enough, which this is a lot to <laughs> meditate on, to go back just as a Christian to think about all these things again. But we've got number 10, names that use word pictures of us. All right, one of the most common is sheep in the flock. My sheep hear my voice. All the beautiful terms that he works. Peter says, we were as sheep going astray, but have returned to the shepherd and bishop of our souls. And even in heaven, we read that the Lord Jesus will feed us and lead us to living fountains of waters. It's like Psalm 23 at the highest level. It's the idea of the indispensable Christ because sheep are stupid. They have no defenses. They don't have horns. They don't have fangs. They don't have hooves. They're just uh, walking dinners for, for uh, their enemies. And so we need the good shepherd every step of the way, the indispensable Christ. The second picture is living stones. The idea that he is the foundation on which we are built, the foundation of Jesus Christ himself, and that he is building a new world out of people. This is a remarkable thing. And we have it hinted at in Hebrews 11, where we read that we believe that the things that now appear were made from things that don't appear. And we wonder what else is out there. God has an amazing world out there. And very often we overlook the people around us who are true children of God. And if we have eyes to see it, we'll recognize, hey, I'm connected to you because we're all being built together into this wonderful home for the Lord. And then the third picture is branches in the vine. And this idea of the life of the vine flowing through the branches, bearing sweet fruit, and the whole key is abide in me. Don't let anything get in between your heart and Christ, and if you do, your life will be fruitful too. So these three illustrate three wonderful word pictures that are commonly used in the New Testament to portray the life of the believer.